transmission. So our next talk is about RIST, a reliable internet stream transport, a promising uh, new protocol. Please welcome Kiran. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Christoph. Uh, if you want to email me or send me a horrible tweet, you can tweet me there. Uh, so uh, we would like to introduce uh, RIST. Um, and more, first of all, what are the goals of what RIST is trying to achieve? Um, and, it, and, and the goals of RIST are low latency uh, video between generally professional devices or between from point to point video or point to multi point video, not necessarily to end users. So during the production process, often, so not in a browser, but between different video devices that are not browser based uh, at a really low latency. And, and the goal is really to have packet recovery on a lossy network. It says internet, but this could also be a lossy WAN of some sort. It may, may not necessarily be the internet. Or it could, could be a wireless link, for example, between diff two different places. And the other, the other kind of goal is backwards compatibility. So at the moment, pretty much all of this stuff is done with a transport stream in UDP. Um, and the goal of what they're trying to achieve in RIST is to do that, to have, have some level of backwards compatibility. So you could send to a non-RIST capable device and it will at least operate normally. It may, it, may, it may not be able to gain the benefits of RISC, but it will still work. So the background to this, um, who came up with RISC? Um, this is it, unusually at an open source event. This is a specification written by a closed uh, industry forum of manufacturers. Um, but there's a bright side I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and they have an, an interest in, there's a lot of uh, this reliable internet streaming kind of technology already done in a proprietary domain at the moment. So there's lots of different proprietary protocols that people use. And they want the ability to have something open standard based. And ideally, building on IETF, you can see that they'll, they've gone and done their own thing a little bit here for the, rightly or wrongly. But the idea is to build on existing IETF standards, which are free and open source and published. And so RIST was published in October 2018. And what was unusual, actually, is RIST was published under a Creative Commons license. So usually most things in broadcast are designed actually to um, keep people out, to actually gatekeep, a bit like the um, scientific publishing industry. It's exactly the same phenomenon. Um, things are kept, kept behind paywalls. They're kept behind secrecy. So designed to, to make sure only a few people can implement it and a few people can understand it. And if you were here in the last presentation, and it's not Willem's fault because Willem is trying to improve things, but he used a lot of acronyms and a lot of terms. And it, this is all deliberately or otherwise there to make it not possible for people to understand. So that only a few people can understand this and make a lot of money out of it and not have open source implementation. So this is actually, although lots of the process was bad from an open source standpoint, publishing under a Creative Commons license is a big deal because it lets people actually understand and implement this and find their problems instead of you know, living in acronym soup where things are closed and yeah. So why not TCP is the question that's obvious. Um, and I, I can't go into this because you could write a book about this. This is a whole research field in itself. But at least to begin with, traditional TCP uh, drops transmission rate with packet loss. There's lots of work in other dev rooms. You can find out about how they're changing that. Uh, and actually, in our use case, we don't generally have throughput drops per se. And I'll talk about how that might be different later. But generally, we just have random packet loss packet loss because of switch capacities, packet loss for other reasons. And we don't necessarily want, this is usually a constant bit rate transport stream. And we want still constant throughput. And we just want random packet loss to be fixed. Uh, UDP itself has native support for multicast. So I mentioned, for example, um, on, if you had a WAN, it's very common to multicast traffic across that WAN in a closed environment. Um, it's quite easy then to have specific receivers request retransmits. Um, as a result, so, so a particular receiver can go and you could have a single sender sending to hundreds of different devices, and each receiver could go and request a retransmit in a multicast environment quite easily if they happen to be lost on a particular network segment. Backwards compatibility, as I mentioned again, want to send risk streams to existing devices. It's also a lot easier in UDP land to do multipathing, to, uh, to send traffic down multiple internet connections. Um, and also, the other interesting thing about UDP itself is, and this is becoming more common, for example, on the web with protocols like QUIC or HTTP3 now, lets the application handle all the congestion control decisions. And that means people can do all sorts of interesting things. You're not curtailed by the legacy of the, the kernel that the sender or receiver is using, which you may not be able to change in some cases. So what, what are things done current? So what, 
that people use currently, um, really, actually, really, really basic 1990s technology, um, forward error correction. And this is an example of it, SIMT 2022-1. Really, really basic in this case. Um, so it's built around the idea of these packet gr groups in rows and columns. So in, I don't know if you can see the colors very well, but row FEC is shown in blue. And as a packet is lost across a row, that's corrected using the FEC packet. And same with the columns. So if a packet's lost in a column, the red packet can be used as a very simple XOR operation, can be used, XOR operation can be used to correct that packet. But the biggest problem is those matrices, matrices have bounded size, um, and you can't handle any loss larger than the matrix. So retransmits are a possible, well, the other solution to this. So there's already existing uh, open source software that does this. Um, it's a problem certain people have been trying to solve for well, since 2007. Um, Aggregate RTP from Videolan was one of them. It, to be honest, the author did it when it wasn't cool. No one was really doing this at the time. Um, this was considered not au fait, and now it's quite commonplace. Um, Aggregate RTP is an example of such that. It lets you aggregate links, but also, as, as a side effect, has retransmission built in. There's also, as of last year, SRT from, I think it's a Canadian company, High Vision. Um, it's a pretty monolithic code base, I would say. It does the same thing. It does retransmits. Um, quite bizarrely, I would say, personally, they've built it around a file transfer application and then added live. Um, the big downside is it supports single link at the moment. Uh, my understanding, but someone can shoot me if I'm wrong, is they have a proprietary add-on that does multiple links, but shoot me if I'm wrong. One big advantage, it has built-in encryption. Uh, that is a big thing. And to be fair to them, um, it's a very complex code base, and people have asked for a specification. And they actually wrote one, to, to my shock. And it's actually 89 pages and exceptionally detailed. It's a very complex protocol. And to be fair to them, if someone actually had to, you know, multiple people sat down and actually wrote this thing, which is amazing. And as I mentioned before, various other proprietary solutions. And they're all some variant of the FEC I showed before. Usually, hope, well, hopefully something more advanced than this 1990s stuff. So there's much more advanced FEC out there that has much better protection and retransmissions. Uh, so they're mixing some kind of solution around that. Uh, I forgot to mention before, the other downside of FEC is there's quite a lot of overhead. So if you don't actually have loss, you, you can waste up to, I think, 25% overhead just adding these matrices that you won't actually end up using. So sort of a quick primer to RTP, a real-time transport protocol, and RTCP, the real-time control protocol. I think that's right. Um, these are the main protocols used um, for UDP-based live video. For example, WebRTC is another example uses RTP, various other applications. So usually the main traffic is sent on port N, and then N plus 1 is for the control and feedback data. So what the sender does is periodically send RTCP packets on port N plus 1 to keep state. And I'll have an example of that in a minute. So the receiver, and then the receiver responds using receiver report RTCP packets. And it's grandly described as NAT traversal, but it's uh, not really NAT traversal per se. It's a, as I'll show in a second, this is a, perma this is a standard functionality of NAT. And what's, what's useful is this RTP and RT RTCP can be over multiple links. So main video goes, main content, usually video, goes over the main, port N, and RTCP over N plus 1. So this diagram shows NAT traversal, quote unquote, in action. The sender sends, a, that's not too bad. sender sends RTP feeds. Usually the sender is behind a firewall, so I can rock up somewhere like FOSDEM, as hopefully this will be able to show, uh, plug in. That's usually NATed. And receivers are usually in a sort of central facility where port forwarding and firewall, you know, rule, access control rules can be done. So sender sends a feed down port N. RTCP packets go across uh, on N plus 1 to the receiver behind the firewall. The receiver then swaps the source port and destination port, sends, a, sends a, uh, return messages back to the external NATed source port, and, and, this, and as a result, the stateful NAT passes it through. So this actually surprises a lot of people the, uh, when they realize you can do that, but this is exactly how DNS works. So you do DNS. When you do DNS, it sends a UDB packet out to a DNS server. You're on that at home, assuming you're using 1.1.1 you know, or 8.8.8, .8 .8, um, not your router's DNS. Um, you send out UDB, pa UDB packet to one of those DNS servers, and it responds in exactly the same fashion. So that's why I was saying it's a bit grand to call this NAT traversal. This is basic NAT functionality. But some people seem to think this is a bit, yeah, this seems to be traversal based. So uh, acknowledgments. Um, so again, RTP 101. 
sorry if you're already aware of this, every LTP packet has a sequence number. So it has a number that, that increments for every packet. Unfortunately, it's 16-bit. Um, probably the RTP developers back in the 90s couldn't really foresee actually bandwidth is quite high. So 16 bits actually wraps around pretty quickly these days, certainly on high bit rate video, very, very quickly in uncompressed video. Um, so this is an example of what a negative acknowledgment looks like. So this is not like TCP where uh, ev there, there are acts in general. This is just negative acknowledgment. So packets which aren't received are requested for retransmission. And I'll show you a bit more about, the, about that in a minute. So first packet comes through. Second one fails. The receiver then requests a retransmit, and the sender then transmits it back. And I'll explain how the signaling works in a second. So there's two types of negative acknowledgment message, the first of which is a bit mask. This is already IETF standardized, already exists for, I think, decades, probably. Um, and it uses a, a base sequence number. So the bits in bold are just the, the codes to identify that type of RTCP packet. It uses a base sequence number and a bit mask. So in, in this example, the base of 100 is lost. And then there's a 16-bit mask showing how the, the next following 16-bit packets, whether they've been received or they've been lost. And then you just, com you just add more and more of the bottom fields along to, add, to show, to show uh, subsequent packets being lost. And this is really useful for just random packet loss, the odd couple here and there. And then they've gone now and decided to do their own thing a bit. Um, and implemented ranges. So this is where you have a range. So if you say I lose 100 packets, this, this field, um, this type of packet uh, is designed to signal ranges at very low, very, very quickly. Um, so they've used an application-specific type 204. And there's a ASCII string RAST to, to signal that. And you can see that they've, they're losing packets at the bottom. So I think they start at 102. They lose 19 packets. To be honest, this is kind of pointless. Uh, this is over-engineering. If, if you've lost that many packets to begin with, the overhead of had it, adding a few more of these isn't going to sort of be consequential because you're going to have to retransmit so much. You're going to save a few bytes for sending a range packet, but so what? You're going to have to send huge amounts of it back anyway. It's not as if the return channel is going to be busy. Um, and so how does the receiver know when it's received a retransmission as opposed to a main? They've done, <coughs> they've done this in a really bizarre way. Um, so the SSRC, I think, is the source. It's basically, uh, I forget the acronym now, but um, it's, it's essentially an identifier for the source. And what they've done to signal a retransmission is set the lowest significant bit of the SSRC to 1, uh, as which is a really bizarre way of doing it, because there's already an existing standard, RFC 4588, which uh, you can look up. And you can see there's already a way of signaling exactly how it should have been done. So they've come up with this hack to do it. But as long as the decoder then knows what the, re what the retransmission is, so it looks at the LSB and says, oh, it's one, so it's a retransmission, then it can, then it can uh, figure out it's a retransmission and put the packet straight um, into its buffer where it needs to be. And then the rest of it, as I mentioned, becomes application specific. So the rate at which the receiver requests retransmits, that's completely implementation defined. So it means people can do all sorts of weird trickery if they wanted to. There's a, there's a whole bunch of problems that are just completely independently defined. How to handle, so let's say, let's say the connectivity cuts for a second or two seconds, and you have to retransmit you know, tens of thousands of packets. How do you handle this thundering herd response? And that's, you know, that's, a, that's an implementation defined problem. That's not really. I'm not even sure how you could really explain it in the protocol itself. So implementation-wise, um, there's two open source ones that I know of. There might be some others. Uh, there's Upipe, which will, in the example directory, hopefully, I will take the risk of the live demo and show you that. And there's VLC in, I think, 4.0, if JB's here, uh, which has the RISC protocol. And there's a bunch of proprietary solutions, so VideoFlow, Zixi, and I think some also some hardware ones. So we've tested all four of those in combination, and they can talk and request free transmits, and they work fine. The hardware ones, if someone wants to give me some hardware to test, yeah, sure. Future work. Uh, encryption, this will, so you could already do encryption at a different layer, so you could run a VPN between your devices, for example, that works perfectly fine. But you, could, you may also want to do encryption in the protocol itself, and this will probably be DTLS. Uh, null packet removal in the protocol. So lots of streams um, have Null packets. Um, if the content's not difficult, it's still padded to CBR, and you'll, 
You'll see in a minute most of the streams that I'll show on the demo will be null packets because they're just one solid color. Bitrate changes. So the, the, there can be a point where the actual link throughput capacity drops, and you'll want to actually change the encoder's bit rates. So how do, you, how do you signal that? There's already IETF work to do this, because in video conferencing, this is already a thing. Uh, pull mode, I'm not sure if they want to do that in the, as part of the protocol, but I mentioned the decoder needs port forwarding. You could have a situation where um, your, your encoder is actually uh, in, not in front of a firewall, your decoder is behind NAT. And how, how do you get the protocol to work without port forwarding? And there's various things. For example, VLC can do this already with RTP via I think RTSP, but that needs to kind of be implemented a bit differently. They also then want to, then the bottom bit is for when they're going a bit crazy. Um, scalable video, <coughs> for those who aren't aware, scalable video is when you have a video stream that allows you to lose data but still be recover a sort of a lower resolution copy or <coughs> a lower frame rate copy. This is really nice in theory. <laughs> It doesn't work in practice. It's often easier just, to, as you see now on the web, for example, just encode the video at multiple bit rates and switch. People have tried scalable video. I'm surprised they're reviving this 2000 era technology because very few people can do it right. It's very, very complex to implement, and the benefits kind of aren't there often. Then this is where they go really, really crazy. Uh, retransmissions on uncompressed video. So Willem told you all about the complexities of doing uncompressed video and all these crazy rules. And now they want to add retransmissions to that. So already in the tens of gigabits of range, and now you want to add, they want to add retransmissions for some reason. This is where I think they're slightly losing the plot of it. But yeah. Right, this is always the tricky bit. Live demo over the FOSDEM Wi-Fi. Could we actually get a stream? Oh. This is, well, I think the hardest bit of the live demo is will the HDMI work? Or will we be, will we be using X Randar? So I did cheat a bit. Um, and in hindsight, maybe the cheating was I have. Oh, yeah? So, so you have some uh, control to mirror. Uh, so, you know, kind of. Not sure why it's showing a quadrant, a quarter of the screen, but so be it. Um, <laughs> oh no, I think it's just resized, and the old, and VLC hasn't gone and resized itself. But anyway, so I I was hoping to cheat, well, and we did cheat by using a VPN. But what we discovered, kind of during testing, is most uh, VPN. So we were using WireGuard in this case, but a lot of VPNs can't handle pumping 50 megabits of UDP traffic through them. They just collapse. <laughs> um, so no, no, but. That will, no, but we want to show. I want to show the. Um, I want to show the command line as well. All right. Um, I just forget about the corner. From, so, I, I actually want that. Right. So, um, I can expand that a bit so I can actually. So you can actually see it is correcting packets as we speak, which is good. Oh, this is one of those fancy touch pads. There we go. That's exactly what I want to see. So. So this, the sender, so this is um, a U-pipe-based encoder in the office, and a, the U-pipe example decode receiver here, and then that's being pumped into VLC for testing. So what you can see is the sender and receiver are estimating round trip times. Uh, no, no, they're, they're calculating round trip times throughout the process. So every, I think it's every second, and as a result, the receiver is using that to figure out how many retransmissions it can send within the bounds of latency that's configured. So I think it's configured to one second latency, if I recall correctly, or maybe three. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, when I want to talk about repairs, it's actually stopped repairing. But it was repairing a lot before. So you can, you, and you'll see a ton of uh, green terminal input. But you, you'll see it send retransmissions. And you'll see that it's actually lost nothing, which is quite good. I think the stream is 10 megabits, or did you cheat and lower it? No, it's 10. It's still 10 megabits. But the intention was to do 50 and really saturate the Wi-Fi. But that probably would have killed all your other devices. But <laughs> Um, never mind. Oh, it's not doing any repairs, but you, you should be able to see it send repairs packets if it was repairing. But sod's law, when I want to talk about repairs, it doesn't. And when we're... Hey, repairing is never necessary, old dog. Well, I don't know. Like, it, was, it was... There we go. There, it's doing some repairs. So you can see that it's found, it's found holes between 9968 and 1994, and it's requesting retransmissions and gradually repairing them. It's found another hole, and it's sent another retransmission. But I, so, so, and you can also see, since I... 
Oh, I have 21 seconds left. So since I think we configured it to one second, that, that gives me about, oh, I have about a 20 millisecond ping to the office. So that gives me 50 different attempts roughly to retransmit. So there's a very good chance I'll be able to get that packet back. So live demo kind of worked, which is, yeah, that's great. Anyway, thanks a lot. Any question? In your uh, future work items slide, there was no mention of any sort of multicast or multi-routing. Is that stuff that they're considering and it's just way far off, or do they consider that out of the domain? What do you mean by multi-route? So, because like, I talked about multiple links, that's already supported. So that's already part of the protocol. It, it recommends you send the retransmit down the retransmit down both links, and you duplicate the retransmit down both links. And it's, again, implementation defined how you want to balance the links. That's completely up to the way the sender and receiver want to do it. Um, oh. That's user and multicasting user already supported again at the beginning. So the receivers, a multicast receiver requests retransmissions from its source, and it's recommended. Um, actually, I think you have to do it that way. You have to um, include your retransmissions in the multicast so that all receivers can benefit from the retransmission, because the chances are, in a, in a, if if let's say there's a, tr a trunk line, you know, there's loss. Or, on a particular fiber line in that part of the world, the chances are there's quite a few receivers that have actually lost the packet. So all of all receivers can benefit from it. Thank you. And somebody there? No, but for the for the online audience. You need it for, no. for the stream. Yeah, I should. Yeah, I forgot to repeat the question. Sorry. So the question before was about multicast and multi. Uh, multi okay. home, multi link. Uh, question uh, Is this protocol uh, also designed with uh, 5G in mind, like uh, where you can have network slicing and uh, set up different uh, pro quality of service uh, levels? Uh, I'm not the expert on 5G. There are people in the room who are. Where, where is Remy? I'm looking to look at him, but I can't see him. Mm. Oh, he's there. Um, no, but it supports uh, UDP. So it's UDP, so you can set the type of service and diff surf flag, mm. which is what people do. Because it would have been nice if it would have been aligned uh, with actually uh, like the, the network link and uh, what you're going to use. Uh, you so can set, yeah, and uh, from what I understand from 5G is... Because um, you have low latency on 5G. Yeah, uh, but I think uh, you could, you, you could, if the operator would um, sign the right commercial agreement with you to support TOS and DiffServe, they could follow the rules theoretically. Th that should be possible. And I, well, it was marketed also possible for 4G, and it never happened. But <laughs> so we'll see. I believe for 5G, 5G is supports point. multicast. Yeah. Uh, there are projects, uh, 5G media project, where they're looking having multicast links uh, yeah, so over so 5G. So 4G, if I understand correctly, but for e yeah. EMBMS, it's some yes. kind of multicast, but that was yeah. not widely deployed. So it's, yeah. it, it's more of a theory versus practice problem. But yes, it's you could do it. I think with TOS and DiffSurf, surely. But Um, have you done benchmarks against existing retransmit-based type things like SRT, like you mentioned, or Quick? Uh, yes, um, we have, but um, I think we saw, from what I understand from, this is what uh, Raphael told me. I, actually, I forgot the last slide, actually, which is thanks to Raphael and uh, because it's on the wrong the producer, but thanks to my colleagues for doing this work. Um, <laughs> 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 Uh, no, um, so so we did, we have done some testing, and from what I understand, we are as good as, if not better. But this was uh, I only got the data literally yesterday. No, literally this morning. So I haven't verified it myself. So other questions? No. no? Thanks. Well, thank you, Kiran. <laughs>